Hello everybody, thank you for joining me for another one-man review. Today I'm going to be looking at two volumes of Dungeon by Joanne Sfar and Louis Trondheim. These are translations released by NBM Graphic Novels. Um, I just grabbed these because after finishing Infinity 8, which was masterminded by Louis Trondheim, um, and then seeing that NBM was, these are new releases, new prints of it that they just released. Uh, I enjoyed Infinity 8 so much, I was like, well, I've got to check out other things by him. Dungeon is a series I've heard about for a while. The thing that I've heard about it is that it has a really complex release structure. And given the fun structure of Infinity 8, where it, you know, it was broken up into the eight different volumes, like recycling the same timeline, um, this seemed interesting where the stories are being told in one world that's one continuous timeline as far as I can tell, but the stories jump around a lot. So I thought, no, Trondheim just seems to like this kind of screwing around with the structure, and I really enjoy that Infinity 8, so I want to check this out. Um, unfortunately, I did not like these as much. Uh, th this second one, the early years, I liked quite a bit more. This first volume, Zenith, which collects volume one and two, um, I didn't like as much. It's a spoof on Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know if some of it's I'm just missing because I've never played that. I'm not a big fan of it. I don't think so. It didn't seem like uh, that type of book where you re really needed to have insider knowledge to get the jokes. The production of the books is pretty cheap. They're paperbacks that just look like they're glued together. Uh, it almost feels like it was printed digitally. Um, the The paper's all right. It's really flimsy, and it's like somewhere between gloss and matte coated paper, so the colors don't show up that great. Uh, the inside of each volume shows the guide to Dungeon, which has these different segments of the story, and it it says to find out more, you could go to nbmpublishing.com. So it breaks up like the different years. Zenith, which this is, is the height of Dungeon, and the early years um, present the creation of Dungeon. These are drawn by Trondheim. He's got a cartoony style with a, kind of a flat coloring. The, the coloring's kind of weird. Um, then, you know, the, the art's good. It's good for what it is. But it just, I don't know, something about the reproduction. I had, I'll admit, I had a really hard time reading the first story. Each one of these collects four stories. And I, I had a really hard time reading the first two stories. And the third and the fourth got better. But I, I almost just put the books down. It didn't, didn't finish. I don't know if that's because it's coming in like in the middle middle of a long epic or something like that but I, I had a real hard time even just I kind of just felt like the story kept changing directions and I couldn't keep up there's a lot of like fun stuff they're they're funny books um and, and stuff where they're playing with words here they're talking about this eyeball that can see uh if it looks at you it sees your ancestors as well and they call that genie ophthalmology so there's stuff like that that I enjoyed, and you know I kept going because it is a well, well-regarded series. Um, a lot of little puns, like here the character is dying and he says "ra," and then this character shouts "Horus." Uh, so I don't know. It's just kind of a wordplay type of humor, but situationally there wasn't much humor. Um, uh, yeah, I was just having a hard time focusing especially during this first story. During this second story, I started to wonder if my inability to pay attention was just an error of translation. I started realizing that the language just feels bad. Like, um, here this character says, you're like a sieve, Herbert. All we can have to do, all we have to do is assign you something for you to end up getting it stolen. It's just not that I'm not sure I'm strong enough for the job. This is just like weird jerky language like that. I'm going to have you take some martial arts classes and you'll see that 
in just a month you'll be killing people with the fingernail. And why not with just a clipping from one by sticking it in their soup people could suffocate with horror. So I, I don't know if it's like funnier in French. I'm assuming this came out in, in France first. Um, and there's like a lot of times where they'll repeat words twice. I only conceal myself like this because I've seen the horrors concealed behind this matchstick house you call reality. So that weird structure of like conceal, concealed, uh, that happens a lot where it just seems like kind of poor writing. And the second volume, there were these weird scenes that took me off guard uh, where the Herbert character has flashbacks. And it took a second to latch on to the fact that those were flashbacks. And so that, that feels like something that would maybe get filled in in another volume. But not having read that, it took a second to piece it together. Um, there's a scene where they're going to like a, some kind of assassin training school or something. And they get sent off these different characters. There's this awful little rat creature and Herbert. And they get sent off to different societies. And they're supposed to make the two societies war, and whoever gets the one side to win, like, wins the assignment. Um, and so this one is like this story of, like, oh, it's this perfect utopian world until this one psychopath comes in and, and teaches them about money and ruins everything and makes them greedy, warlike creatures. And then Herbert just goes and gets along. Um, I'd never been a fan of that weird, it's kind of like this anarchist utopian idea that if we reverted back to our beautiful natural state, we would all be getting along just fine, like the state of animals is somehow not also, like like when you put money in it, all of a sudden things have to murder each other, like animals aren't running around killing each other all the time, so it, it's, it, I don't know, that that kind of bothered me like just personally philosophically um there are a lot of nice details in the stories in the art like right here there there's this meeting of these different people i i, I honestly i don't even remember what this story is about um but like the little detail of a ghost and his hand is sticking up through the table there's a lot of really enjoyable aspects about it where you can tell they're really populating a world in an interesting way um but man i just found the first two stories really hard to pay attention to the third story was much more clear they send out a note that's like they just pick some random names and say oh we got this princess cat they want people to come quest to the dungeon and so they fake that there's a princess capture there but it turns out there's a real princess with that with that name from the town that they made up um, and she's happens to be missing, come to find out because she saw the note and said, oh, this is a good excuse to run away. And then her family goes looking for her and that causes some shenanigans. So <laughs> I, I like that. I like that premise. And it seemed like the story was more cohesive around that premise. Um, the humor starts getting better. I, I like this scene here. Unbeliever, uh, Herbert's got a sword and he can't take it out until he accomplishes three great quests. And the first two volumes, I guess, are just him accomplishing those quests. Maybe that's what I was missing. Um, now he can get it out and it's the Sword of Destiny and they're, they're talking about that. Unbelievers, whoever carries the Sword of Destiny has sacred mission of reuniting the seven objects of destiny. You have to accomplish this quest. Uh, and then this character, I don't even remember his name. I couldn't care about the characters in this volume either. Um, he says, well, what would that do? And the sword says, so, or the belt that carries the sword, sorry, not the slightest. And then they both go, ha ha, well, then we don't give a damn. And I like that, uh, you know, I like that kind of satire, uh, on, on the genre, which is what this is. Um, and then here, the... The, the like he's been he's completed his three crests and finally able to draw the sword once and then the sword plays a trick on him it's like ah you can't draw me until you accomplish three new deeds like making him think that you got to accomplish three new great deeds every time you want to draw the sword and and then he's like what i have to start all over and i'm not kidding you can draw the sword so like the belt's messing with him that's fun uh, probably my favorite 
seen in this whole first collection of four stories is the princess who's run away has stumbled a- across these ogres um, and they give her a a bait she asked for some food and they give her a baby to eat and then he said yeah you should never eat them when they're dead because that means maybe they were sick or poisoned and there's just kind of this running joke about about the eating the baby um here's another instance where just the the i think it's a translation error or just a problem i i feel like i would like these books better and like the wordplay in them would be more enjoyable if if the translations were better. Ever since we no longer have the eye of Biscara keeper, we can't keep a watch on who's coming and going. It's, I don't know. It's just it's just weird. And then here you can see like the production of these books. I just got these. These are brand new, and they're falling apart already. So I feel like I feel like this is probably a better series. Um and NBM kind of just maybe did a hack job. I don't know. The printing's not good, the production's not good. It feels like the translation's not that great. This second volume, uh the early years which has art by Christoph Blaine, I found a lot more enjoyable. Um it has like one kind of main character, Hyacinth, who's going from being a naive young student to a like zoro like figure and then there's a real like time jump plot twist at the end of the book and so it it followed a character more and i felt like that was more successful um still some of these weird not as much but still some of these weird things with the language here's the shabbiest guest ever before seen here so like starting and ending a sentence with here like that just like, here's the shabbiest guest ever before seen. I don't know. Maybe they're trying to make fun of, like, old speech patterns or something. Um, throughout reading these series, I was thinking they had to have influenced a series I do really like called Headlopper by Andrew McLean. And um, here, someone actually says, a thief, the master, has his head lopped off. So I wonder, because it's the same type of spoofy adventure story with the cartoony art if there's an influence on Andrew McLean and Headlopper and Headlopper I like a lot this is a really great series so I would I would recommend this but I do think that Dungeon was probably an influence on Headlopper and I would recommend this volume the early years and maybe if I went back because stories are being told out of order, this would make more sense. It's definitely a lot of the same characters that are old people watching the dungeon in, in the, the Zenith um, show up here as, as like younger people. So maybe, maybe it's that structure. Um, this one's funny. He's, when he's becoming Zoro, he's uh, trying to come up with a name. So... And people immediately recognize him. So they say, Hyacinth. And he's trying to hide who he is. I don't know who you're talking about. I am Justice. That's a name? No, it's a concept. I still have to come up with my alias. Just go on calling yourself Justice. At least it's clear. No, I, I can find a better one. And so he's he constantly is kind of trying to find this better name. Tell the mayor that the shadow of Justice is in town. Uh, and then... He goes out and he has a crush on this bad female assassin character. So they have a little scrabble out there. And um, he goes to grab her a, a flower out of a window and succeeds. So but by the end of the page, he's now telling his buddy, Call me the Nocturnal Rose. Sounds more like an erotic novel. Um <laughs> And then here, and he's like, I, I don't care what your opinion is. But then here, he, he has changes his name to the Rose of Justice. So I really, like, I liked that character of Hyacinth and him being kind of a sweet, bumbling little kid, but then actually being fairly successful uh, as a Zorro do-gooder. Here's a really funny sequence where he's got some money that he took stole from 
crooks and he's trying to do something good with it. So he goes to an orphanage and leaves it on the doorstep and bangs on the door, hoping that they'll come out and go, oh, someone left us a bunch of money. And then they just don't see it and go back inside. So it's like, okay, I got to go knock on the door. And then he just freaks the woman out and she runs back inside. So I feel like those comedic moments work better in this. I like the art better in this as well. Um, the artist in this is much better. And then there's just these other like more hu human moments with the character. So Doctor, I had a little adventure, but there's just too great a difference between the image I'd had of love and the reality. It's annoying. Excuse me, my mind was elsewhere. I don't understand a thing. So I slept with the girl. Now it burns when I pee and it itches too. And then this character's face is really good. Um, so reading the, the first volume, well, I don't know if it's proper to call it the first volume, but uh, Zenith volume one and two, uh, I, I almost didn't even want to start the second one. Reading the second one, uh, my opinion of the series has gone back up. And I, I quite like this one. Um, so I don't know. I, I think if they release another one, I will I will grab a third third one of these, whichever one comes out next, and, and see if the series continues to get better or if at least it has this quality to it. Um, but I would say if you're into kind of this funny satire, you're into the Dungeons & Dragons thing, it seems like especially if you're into world-building stuff, which I'm not the biggest world-building fan this would be a good series for you if you want just more straightforward character development and emotional stuff this one seems better it almost seems like it's trying to take the piss out of something like star wars where you start in the middle and then fans get obsessive about like like oh well we mentioned that han solo was in this race and then we got to go do a movie about this race and then they're you know they got to have the mandalorian and I, they got to fill in like every detail of the world with the fan fiction maybe they're making fun of that with the structure of this where they're suggesting that there's like you know 200 some issues but you've read and they even have the numbering in here and that was something when i looked this i remember reading about this series a long time ago this is like issue negative 45 page 43 and they have that throughout here and then it, it like counts down like these are issue negative 44 and then there's the time jump, and all of a sudden the numbering's just normal. So I guess this is issue one. Um, but then this volume didn't have, like, I didn't see. It's just numbered 91, 92. So it's not, like, plus. I don't know, but there's a weird numbering convention with these. And I, and I think by leaving out chapters, they're maybe purposely playing with that idea of the fanatic fan who has to fill in every chapter. And like probably never going to get to it. Um, so that's funny to me. But I don't know it has any real impact on the reading experience. Other than throwing me into something where there was, there was maybe too many characters that I didn't know anything about yet. So it's an interesting structural play. Trondheim seems really curious about story structure. I th These are the only two works I've read of his. But... I've really liked Infinity 8 quite a lot. This one I'm still skeptical on. Um, if you're going to start with it, though, you can buy both of these. They just came out. I read this one first and then this one because these were the first ones that were released. But I would reverse that. I would read Early Years first and then read this. Um, I'm a little tired from reading them, honestly. And so I'm just really skeptical to go back to this one having enjoyed this more but maybe later but if you get these definitely read early years first and then zenith all right thanks for joining me take it away jack